Hello, and welcome to Clearer Thinking with Spencer Greenberg, the podcast about ideas that matter. I'm Josh Castle, the producer of the podcast, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. In this episode, Spencer speaks with Katya Grace about group dynamics and social pressure, how to be a better person, and quantitative versus qualitative methods. Katya, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. So the first topic I want to discuss with you is an interesting form of bias that might prevent the world from dealing with really important challenges. Do you want to tell us what being group struck is and why you think that matters? Yeah, I'm not sure what it is, but I use the name for a, a set of strange behaviors it seems like people have when they're in groups. So the kind of situation that inspired thinking about this is like in this experiment in the 60s, some people piped smoke into a room where they had people filling out a survey. And they found that if there was just one person in the room, that person would worry about the smoke and get up pretty quickly. Whereas if there were multiple people in the room, like I think three was the number they had, then they will sit there for much longer for some reason. So you might wonder why that is. My understanding is it was even longer if they had Confederates in the room that just would sit there acting as though nothing bad was happening. Yeah, that's true. I think that's sort of less surprising to me that if the people around you are pretending nothing's wrong, that you won't do anything. Whereas in the case where they're not even pretending, they're just real people, it seems more surprising if just no one acts. Ironically, this actually happened to someone I know. They were sitting in a a lecture and a a fire alarm started going off. I don't think there was um, any smoke at the beginning, but basically the teacher started ignored it and then all the students ignored it. And then I think there started to be a smell of smoke. Oh, wow. And so my friend finally, who's like sitting at the back of the classroom, gets up and walks (laughs) out of the classroom. Everyone's just sitting there. So yeah, I do think that this sort of thing happens in real life, uh, though I don't know if anyone's tried to replicate that original study or what happened with that. Yeah, I don't know about proper real replications of it. I know someone made some videos, uh, they like roughly did a replication and put videos on YouTube of that. So you can see see what people look like when they're thinking about whether to leave. But I, th- I think the main observation is that like the person in your friend's situation there, somehow it's like really hard to get up and leave, even though you kind of know what the right thing to do is. And I think there are a lot of situations that feel a bit like that to me, at least. So without knowing what the explanation is, my friend came up with the word group struck for it. And I think it's interesting to figure out whether it's a a general thing. Would you say that the early response to COVID was like this? I had the really intense impression once I became convinced that COVID was going to be a really big problem that I sounded like a crazy person saying it. And I ended up doing a blog post in late February. And, you know, some people actually got angry at me for doing it, saying I was being, you know, alarmist or whatever. But I definitely had this really strong sense that I was like breaking some social convention by talking about it. And I know people that, you know, were significantly earlier than that. You know, I wasn't wasn't even the earliest to, to raise an alarm. Yeah, I think that is another good example, probably. Or also, I think more notable to me with early COVID was just like wearing a mask or something like Another situation where I really feel this sort of pressure on my behavior in a group, which is really strange, is like, I think in early COVID where other people weren't wearing masks and I wanted to wear a mask, I just felt really, it was embarrassing to wear a mask, especially like a big mask. (laughs) I would like to wear like a P100 mask that's much more effective. Um, And if other people are just wearing surgical masks or something, like my brain would think that it had to explain itself. And I would, I would imagining what I would say if someone asked me, like, why are you wearing this like much more effective mask? Sort of surprising because like, <laughs> you know, it, it's much more effective. Why, why should I be terribly embarrassed about that? Especially once, you know, society at large is, is doing all kinds of things about the pandemic. Yeah, I noticed a lot of people wearing cloth masks uh, long past the point when you think that one should realize that they probably don't work as well. Um, uh, but that sort of became like, okay, as long as you were wearing a mask. Actually, the other day I saw one of the more disturbing advertisements I've ever seen, which was for this thing called the unmask, which is basically to trick people into thinking you're wearing a mask because it looks like a mask, but has no effectiveness whatsoever. Oh, wow. (laughs) I was going to say, I I think an interesting thing here, though, is that it's also embarrassing to not wear a mask when other people are wearing a mask, like maybe thus I guess you might have this unmask so that you you know you can follow the rules and be allowed into places or something. But I think also people I talk to say that it's embarrassing for them to be outside without a mask if other people around are wearing them, even though they think it's like fine because it's outside or something. And so I think that's a case where you're not being overcautious, you're being undercautious, but you still somehow have the same kind of like not following what everyone else is doing shame or something. 
which makes me think that maybe it's not just about like looking too afraid, but is rather a broader thing. Oh, yeah, I, absolutely. I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw cases of people getting, getting yelled at for not wearing masks on the street. But as far as I can tell, at least at this point, the evidence suggests that if you're like more than six feet away from people outdoors, like you're probably very safe. And so, yeah, I think it, I think it really doesn't have much at all to do with right. like the actual level of safety. It has to do with what people around you are doing and kind of what's considered normal and acceptable. And there was a, a really startling tweet that was sent early out during the pandemic. And I might get the exact details wrong, but basically an epidemiologist went to a epidemiology conference just as people were beginning to worry about COVID and they posted um, online saying, you know, for all of those who saying we should wear masks, I'm at a conference with 800 epidemiologists and there's not a single mask in sight. We all are, are all are using lots of hand sanitizer though. And the point of this was to like show to everyone that they don't need to be scared and wear a mask and it just aged so <laughs> badly. <laughs> and it does make me wonder, were some of those epidemiologists like, oh, I wish I could put a mask on, but nobody else is wearing a mask. Right, so I feel yeah. too weird, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but to generalize this point a bit, because I think this is a really important topic, how would you define being group struck in the more general case? I think I actually don't have a great definition. I have more like a long list of situations where it feels to me like a similar thing is going on for some reason. And I'm sort of still at the point of wondering how exactly to define such a thing. But it's broadly, it's cases where people are acting apparently not even in their interests. And it seems like some sort of social pressure is going on. But I think especially where the, the reason for the social pressure is kind of unclear. It seems like there are cases where people are constrained by people watching them to not look silly in some way where, where it would obviously look silly to do the thing they would want to do. And that seems sort of less interesting. Yeah, it, it becomes, I think, especially fascinating when someone literally is putting their life at risk in order to do the thing that's normal. I've seen cases of this where someone goes to the doctor for something really serious. The doctor tells them something that clearly makes no sense. You know, I mean, there are a lot of good doctors, but there's also some bad doctors or the doctor misunderstands something or whatever. And the person doesn't do like the very basic, like pushing back and being like, no, I think you misunderstood me. Right. <laughs> no, that doesn't really make sense. And here's why. And then they just come away like, oh, the doctor told me to do this. And you're like, wait, but like, we're talking about your health here. Like, really? You're not going to like say something to the doctor? Yeah. These situations look a bit like the kind of bystander effect situations, but are especially interesting, I think, when it's like your own interests that are at stake. Like, maybe it's not that surprising if 100 people are watching an emergency for someone else that like one of them doesn't act to intervene because they're hoping someone else will do it. But if the emergency is like their own maybe being caught in a fire, you might think that they wouldn't sort of stand by and watch. It seems just in general that we treat social rejection as way more important than it is by any like reasonable, quote, objective standard. In other words, like people will be terrified of giving us speech in front of strangers that even if they never expect to see those strangers again. And you're like, well, what's really going on here? My suspicion is that there's something about human nature where like those kinds of scenarios where, where you'd have social rejection in the ancestral environment, you know, 50,000 years ago might have just been much more dangerous than they are. Whereas in today, there's so many people and it really doesn't matter even if like a bunch of people think you look like a fool because you're not going to be like thrown out of the tribe and die alone in the woods or something. Yeah, that seems right. And I think in some of these cases, like even if we accept that humans really don't like social rejection, it's sort of hard to understand like why they're expecting so much social rejection anyway. Like, I don't know, in, a, you know, in an experiment where people get asked which lines look similar length for them and they go with the answer that other people say, even though the other people are uh, actors who are saying the wrong thing to get them to conform. Like the Ash Conformity experiment? Yeah, yeah. Like if if they said the wrong answer there, like how much are they expecting, or if they say a different answer to everyone else, in what scenario would that cause you to be socially rejected to any large extent? <laughs> it's almost like we're paranoid about social rejection. Yeah. Right. It's like it's like it's not like we're just worried about the like, you know, the chance that people like tease us a little bit. It's like we're worried that like we're literally gonna die or something. And so we act like just in a way that just seems totally crazy sometimes to avoid like even a small probability of extreme social rejection. Yeah, it doesn't feel internally like I'm expecting to be like, I don't know, kicked out of all of my social connections or something if I'm seen out in public wearing a giant mask. <laughs> and so I think that part of this explanation 
seems confusing to me. What is your internal experience? Like if you're about to do something that you feel like others would be like, why is she doing that? I think it involves a lot of like trying to justify myself. Somehow my brain is in some kind of loop where it's just like coming up with things to say if someone were to ask me. So maybe it just doesn't get as far as like, but what if I just didn't have anything to say? And they ask me, it seems like if I imagine that, I don't especially imagine anything that bad happening. So it's sort of confusing. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like sometimes if I have a worry that people are going to like think I'm weird for doing something, like I just like in advance, I'm like coming up with like, well, if they say this and I can say this, (laughs) you know, or whatever, like to make it seem not as weird. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I don't quite know what to make of it. Like, I I mean, I think my most extreme example of this is just sometimes I'll go do public speaking and I'll like, I'll feel totally fine and, and calm. Other times I'll just feel really nervous. And the best thing I can say about it is it's it's like some part of my brain thinks I'm like going into battle or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's some li- there's some little part of me that's freaking out, even though my like you know my system too is like, oh, come on, it's not a big deal. You've given a hundred talks. Why does this matter? And I find that it's especially likely to occur if it feels sort of out of my comfort zone. Like there's something different about it than other settings I've been in or a different audience or or this kind of thing. Yeah. So what are some other examples of being group struck? I think one that happened to me once that I vividly remember because it was so shocking to me at the time was in high school I was watching across the schoolyard I guess some other students like putting pins in people's legs um, or or, like needles or something like they they were coming up behind them and then putting the needle into their legs and then running away and I guess at the time I was pretty ignorant about the world and I thought that I don't know this meant there was a high likelihood they were like spreading AIDS between the people or something so I was like oh no these people are going to die or something and so I was very concerned about this and I was like I should tell a teacher and somehow I just like couldn't I was just paralyzed like I could sort of see there was a teacher over there and I I feel like it took me I don't know at least 10 minutes to get up and tell a teacher about it and I think that it was somehow that there were all those other people there and they would see me going to do it and I like couldn't understand why I couldn't do it. Hmm. So that's a really interesting example. So now that brings to mind a few possibilities. One is the one we talked about, like maybe maybe we have this deep seated fear of being ostracized from the tribe, right? Like we kicked out, you know, in an evolutionary environment. If you're not in the tribe, you're basically dead. Another possibility is could we fear like mob mentality? Uh, like could we fear like a mob comes down and like, you know, kills us, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Like like people will just suddenly turn on you. And obviously by saying fear it, I don't mean that like you're sort of consciously reasoning it out. I mean, just on some like very low level programming you know, this is this is kind of a behavior that helped our ancestors survive. But then a third possibility that just came to mind is it could it be that we like use the tribe to think for us and something's going on where it's like, wait, but the tribe seems to think this is OK. And I yet I think it's not. And like the tribe's thinking is like part of what I should do, like some kind of very strong rooted mimicry. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. And I think like my default expectation would be that like the individuals would pay attention to what the rest of the group is thinking and kind of like do a back and forth, like updating on how another are responding. But then I guess it's kind of strange if like the group is just always slower at say responding to signs of a fire, because you might think that's the wrong response. So I guess in all these cases, it is, you know, it is an experiment. So it is in fact the right response. I, I, it seems possible that the group is right here. Hmm. No, but it's an interesting point. Like in cases where the group is wrong, it seems like that at the very least, if it's a mimicry response and it's kind of misfiring. John Hyatt has a really nice quote, which is that he thinks of humans as being 90% chimp and 10% bee. Uh, And he's referring there to sort of the way that bees almost act like a single unit. Like, sure, you can talk about a single bee as having agency, but like, you know, the right level of analysis for bees is probably closer to like the whole hive having agency. And um, if we think of humans as like being a little bee-like, maybe there's something where in a certain sense, we're like always working on behalf of the tribe and not just on ourselves, right? Or at least many of us or most of us. And uh, maybe like part of what's happening is we're outsourcing like our thinking to the tribe, at least in part. And so for like decisions, like what should I eat for lunch? That's like the chimp part. But then like certain other things, maybe we just like automatically start outsourcing the thinking. Yeah. You might wonder, in like, I guess I'm thinking of the video I saw of like a fire alarm going off and the whole group of people hearing it and not getting up. Um, and then they interviewed them afterwards. And it seemed like 
many of them were hoping that someone would kind of like lead them outside to sort of save them. And it seems like if everyone behaves in this way, like like if all of the people were identical and they are all like, ah, oh, it kind of seems to me like this is bad, but I don't want to kind of stand up and lead the group outside. You might expect the group just always stays there. And so I, I wonder if it's partly to do with different people behaving differently. And if you had someone who was more leaderly, that that's what's needed. Oh, that's interesting. Like if you bring random people together and put them in the room and none of them are like sort of leader take, take charge kind of people, then maybe nobody says that thing. But if you brought like a, you know, alpha leader in, maybe they would just immediately be like, hey, there's smoke, let's get out of here. And everyone's like, yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, you might think that by chance you would get some of the alpha leader people, but it could be that people respond differently to different contexts, so, such that if you brought everyone in randomly, none of them feels like they should behave like an alpha leader because they don't know the other people and stuff. Whereas if it was, I don't know, a group of friends, then it would be clearer who was the one to be like, hey guys, <laughs> let's pay attention to this. Yeah, though it really does seem like there are individual differences on this, right? You know, people talk about the Milgram experiment where they where they got people to uh, administer electric shocks to someone they thought was a real person. Um, you know, this study has been questioned in various ways, but it seems like at least in some of the cases, people really were thinking they were electric shocking someone that they didn't know. Yet some people who believed that they were like that this was a real study just refused to do it, right? You know, a lot of people. You know, what made it, what made it sort of shocking was how many people didn't refuse. How many people went through with it? But then you look at those people who did refuse, and you're like, well, what's the deal with those people? Like, that's pretty interesting, right? Maybe it comes down to individual differences in personality and things like that. And so maybe there are important personality factors here. Yeah, that seems right. I think I try to be better at doing embarrassing things, which is also a good all-purpose excuse for if someone would ask you why you're doing an embarrassing thing. <laughs> There's some embarrassing things that sort of create a negative externality right? Because they kind of like embarrass everyone around or like are uncomfortable. And there are other ones that are really are like totally harmless. If anything, they're kind of amusing to other people. And um, CIFAR, Center for Applied Rationality, has this cozy exercise, they call it, comfort zone expansion, it stands for, Mm. where they have you go out and pick something that makes you uncomfortable, but won't make other people uncomfortable and have you go try to do it. And um, there's some pretty funny ones that people came up with, like asking people like, hey, do you mind if I have your shoe or things like this? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, um, and, you know, one person actually has persuaded someone to give them their shoe. <laughs> and, um, but uh, but yeah, there's, there really does seem to be something to developing the skill of like being able to push through the discomfort when you know that discomfort is just your own thing. And it's not actually harming anyone else. I think it's also interesting to think about like how to make this kind of thing easier for people in general, like at a or societal or group level the, the thing we were just talking about is like learning yourself to overcome this kind of encumberment um, but you can also think about how to make a situation better for people to be able to just get up if they heard a fire alarm or something right like i imagine if everyone had to like secretly record how they felt about the fact that smoke was coming through the door right and nobody else would see and then like nobody else would know that it was them like maybe everyone would be like yeah i'd rather leave <laughs> you know right <laughs> yeah I mean, the classic explanation for the smoke room experiment is that everyone's kind of looking around everyone else and being like, hmm, nobody else is freaking out. So I guess it's fine. Right. So like everyone else taking cues from everyone else, but because everyone else is also taking cues from everyone else and nobody's sort of acted yet, everyone assumes it's okay. Yeah. You might wonder why we would have that behavior in general. Like it seems very close to a behavior that that would actually work where you take cues from one another and like actually escalate, like you you see that everyone else is like a little bit concerned and then you look into it a little bit more and so on, which I think does happen often. Right. But if everyone's like too controlled in their response and you can't read it, any concern, then it can go the other way. Yeah. Do you have any other examples of being group struck you want to share? I think just like wearing a weird outfit in public uh, is another easy place to feel something like this. I think maybe sometimes at parties tend to form giant groups of people. And I like having smaller group discussions. And my impression is other people often like smaller group discussions too. But it's very hard, I think, to just get up from a large group discussion and just go and stand by yourself until someone else comes to join you uh, without like looking at your phone or pretending like you're busy with something else. That's funny. The other day I was at a party, like an outdoor kind of rooftop thing. And my friend afterward comes up to me. He's like, I'm really impressed with how well you get out of conversation. (laughs) There is really an art to like, you know, okay, this was nice, but like, I'm ready to move on and like making it not awkward and, and like being, but being able to like kind of actually fall on your preferences. Yeah. I think 
something like being group struck also does happen there like especially i don't know if there are several people and you would have to like say something to leave like you can't just sort of walk away without comment that that can be surprisingly hard yeah everyone can be stuck in like a conversation they're not enjoying and nobody leaves yeah. <laughs> it's awful when i've thrown some gather town events which is this online service for doing you have a little avatar and you can move around the space and then when you get near people they can hear you and you can talk to them via video chat I actually tell people at the beginning, like, let's use a social norm where you can just, if there's more than one other person in the conversation, you can just leave without saying anything. Because if you don't do that, everyone gets stuck in these large clusters, which is really not great when you're on video chat, especially. Um, and so, but it's like much better if like there's more than, uh, t you know, two or more other people there, you can just leave and, uh, you know, just go form your new group. Nice. Did that work? Like, did people behave differently? Yeah, it definitely helps. And I think part of the reason it helps is because nobody ha knows what social norms are supposed to exist on Gather Town. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> like in, re in real life, we have a sense of like what's normal. And so people, like if you just said that to people, they wouldn't necessarily like know it's okay. But in Gather Town, like, okay, I guess this is how Gather Town works, right? <laughs> I think I'd want to try that at a real party now. Well, I guess if you get everyone to opt in at the beginning, I think it would work. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could just tell them it might work as well. But yeah, I don't know. My, my friend had a party once where at the start she gave people stickers that said whether they want to be in large or small group conversations. And if they're in small group conversations, they just like weren't allowed to have more than three people in a conversation. So <laughs> someone funny. else joined, like someone just had to leave. Yeah, I, well, I'm actually really fascinated with the way you can set a social norm. So I run this uh, group called Ergo where we throw social experiments. And we do a lot of playing with this where basically when we send out an invite to the event, we basically explain what the rules will be at the event. And so we kind of like this opt in like, okay, if you're going to come here are the rules. And so that's a really nice way to like filter for the people that are like interested in, in trying those rules. And we've experimented like all different sort of uh, rules for different events. And they, they really kind of can drastically change how the event goes. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Do you write up the things about it? Like, can I read about this? Occasionally, we have a website. Our website is ergoevents.org. So it's E-R-G-O-E-V-E-N-T-S dot org. So I know that you have also thought about how this idea of being group struck applies to topics like AI safety. So what are your thoughts on that? I was originally thinking about this because Elias Yudkowsky um, wrote this post saying that there are no fire alarms for artificial general intelligence, which is to say that like people are kind of acting as they do in the case of smoke coming into the room, like they're seeing some evidence, um, but not wanting to like look too scared. So they just keep sitting there, not doing anything. But if there was a fire alarm, maybe they that would give them all common knowledge that it was now like not embarrassing to leave the room, which I guess doesn't actually, uh, fire alarms, it seems like don't actually cause people to leave the room happily necessarily. But, you know, maybe you could imagine a, a, a better fire alarm that did that. So the idea is that uh, if one day we build very dangerous AI technology, a lot of people will be kind of waiting around being like, hmm, I, I don't yet have permission to freak out about this. And then like by the time that they do start to freak out, it'd be too late. Is that the concept? Yeah, where I think Elias would probably think they should already be freaking out, and, but don't have permission. But that also, as things look more and more dire, they will just continue to sit there and not do anything because the situation will sort of be the same, just with like more smoke or something. And so do you have any thoughts about how do we break people out of being group struck? My guess is that actually as people get more evidence, that helps somewhat that they won't just sit there forever watching more and more smoke come into the room or more and more impressive AI things appear without acting. So I, I think... That sort of thing helps. My guess is that evidence that there's a problem that is more sort of objective that they can point to to like justify their concern is like more helpful. Where if it's more relying on their own personal judgment of the evidence, then there's more scope for other people thinking that their judgment is bad or something. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, like if I think I'm having a heart attack because I feel weird, then other people might think that I'm pretty anxious and they might think that I don't have good judgment about that sort of thing. Whereas if I thought I was having a heart attack because I had some sort of device that said in an objective way that something was going wrong with my pulse or something, then that's more helpful for me being able to easily panic about whether I'm having a heart attack to other people because I can point to the device and they might be like, all right, well, that's objective evidence. 
Right. So it's basically defense against being thought of as a weirdo or, you know, odd or whatever. If you can point to something that's sort of outside of yourself or more objective or respectable for, for why you're thinking this way. Right. I think another interesting class of ways to, to help people not be group struck is just providing other incentives for doing the thing. So I think like at a party providing like different places that people can go and stand for, for other reasons, like to get a drink or something or to look at a thing allows them to reason to leave a conversation or providing events that are fun to go to that are also about concern about some risk um, allows people to be ambiguous about how concerned they are. Right. Sort of like giving plausible deniability, right? Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes someone, when they go on to get out of a conversation, they're like, oh, um, do you know where the restroom is or something like that, right? It's like, oh, well, this person may not be leaving because they don't like me or not enjoying my conversation. Maybe they just need to go to the bathroom, right? And it's like, right. if you if you can have that kind of cover, then you can do weird things or break social norms without being uh, punished for it, or at least perceiving you're going to be punished. Yeah. I actually have a funny trick I use sometimes in conversations when I'm ready to talk to, to someone new. I'll just say, hey, you know, it's really, really nice to meet you. And then like, I'll sort of like give the like, we're finishing the conversation kind of tone. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, yeah, it was great to meet you too. And, you know, we shake hands and then I walk away. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's kind of funny how like, you think you need to give an excuse, but like, you don't necessarily actually, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Although now I you know that I've said this on the podcast, I don't know if I can use this anymore. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't mean I didn't enjoy talking to the person. Maybe I'm just ready to go to the bathroom or, <laughs> or talk to someone new. Yeah. I don't know if I even call that a trick in some sense. It's just like, yeah, do the straightforward thing. <laughs> right. Don't overthink it. But somehow it's very hard to do. Or maybe it's like the thing that you're actually worried about on some level is probably like this person feeling bad or thinking badly of you. And then like you can just cut through that by like making it clear that we're glad you met them, you know, assuming you were right. And you know, and then like being warm and making them feel good, <laughs> you know, and then they don't feel bad. So you kind of solve the problem that way. Yeah. But I wonder if there's a version of that for like existential risk. Like, <laughs> <laughs> how do you, you know, what is the direct way to make it so people are okay with like, yeah, like, I think we should be freaking out a little bit or, you know, or at least like, here's a sign that if this occurs, we should freak out. Yeah. Do you want to form a positive new habit? Are you interested in improving your diet, learning a skill, or getting fit with daily exercise? Then you should check out the free Clearer Thinking program called Daily Ritual, a Habit Creation System. Powered by over two years of research, the Daily Ritual program teaches simple techniques that can help you form a new, beneficial daily habit. If you're motivated to make a positive change to your daily routine, these techniques may be just the thing you need to lock in your new activity. Are you ready to reshape your day? To use the free daily ritual tool or to find Clearer Thinking's other free tools and many courses, head to clearerthinking.org. So changing topics, another interesting concept that you brought up with me was how to be a good bounded person. So can you tell us what, what does that mean to be a bounded person? And then let's talk about how to do that well. Yeah, I think a, a basic theory of, of how to act in the world is to maximize expected utility, which is to sort of look at each of your options and then understand the consequences and then rate those consequences according to your preferences. But this is like very impossible uh, without, I mean, sort of going to take arbitrary amounts of effort. And so by a bounded person, I mean one that's not capable of kind of infinite amounts of thinking for every choice of action. So then what does it mean to be a bounded person? So I guess I'm saying all people are bounded. Abstract people sort of in theory are perhaps capable of considering all of their options and doing this kind of expected utility maximization. Whereas a real person, you know, if you wake up on Saturday and you have nothing planned and you think about what to do, you can't just consider every combination of different muscle movements and then for each one predict the entire future of the universe or a distribution of a different futures of the universe, and then apply your values to all of those to decide what to do. So I'm interested in how we might think of how we behave instead of that. It's funny how economics, at least classically, assumes that people are unbounded, right? Like it assumes that somehow people are considering every possible muscle movement they could do at every single moment. I mean, implicitly, like that's not, you know, talked about too much, but that is seemingly the assumption. 
as someone once said to me, which I thought was kind of funny, like even one, one single being that like was what economists describe humans as would probably just take over the world. Like if there was just one of those people, right? Like right. <laughs> it would be infinitely intelligent, right? Yeah. We're bound in the amount of computation we can do. We're bounded in the number of different options we can consider, right? So we have a creativity bound, like what options we can even think of. We're bound in working memory, like how many things we keep in our mind. So we have like all these different bounds on us as beings, right? And so then how do you think about, you know, the optimal thing versus the thing that a bounded person will do? I'm not sure what the best way to think about it is. My impression is that people often kind of think of what humans should do as kind of like the the unbounded thing, but just kind of like an approximation of that. But given that that's so far from what we can possibly do, it seems to me like it might be better to have a, a clearer picture of what the the approximation looks like. It's, it sort of makes me think about like, imagine someone's describing how you should hit the ball in baseball. And they're like, well, you know, in theory, you would like understand the physics of like how things move and you do all the, you know, you you'd solve some kind of like differential equation for like the initial velocity of the ball and the, you know, the air viscosity and all this stuff. But obviously, you know, we're not smart enough to do that. So instead, you should just approximate the differential equation, and solve <laughs> right. it approximately. And you're like, well, Roughly no, that's not, that's not how you go from like, here's how to do it perfectly to here's how to do it as a bounded person. You do it by like doing it a completely different method, which is like just practice hitting baseballs or something like this, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> practice living life. It seems still nice to have like an abstract idea of what the thing to do as a more bounded creature is so that you can kind of reason about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, when we're, whenever we're trying to do something, it helps to have both a explicit understanding of it and an implicit understanding, like where we can just do it automatically. And then like by having the explicit understanding, we can kind of guide and train our implicit understanding. A classic example would be martial arts, where you can learn to do martial arts just by like copying someone and repeating a lot. But if you also have an explicit understanding, then you can kind of critique what you're doing and be like, oh, that wasn't quite right for these reasons. And then you can kind of like make your own adjustments which can then help you train yourself and get better. Yeah, right. A proposed abstract description of part of what it is we do that, that I sometimes think about is like, instead of seeing us as considering all the options, suppose that at each point, you know, sort of like in each little time block, we can basically consider two options. And two options are kind of determined by salience somehow. I don't know, maybe like when I wake up, I have the option to like keep my eyes closed or to open them first. And then after that, like suppose I decided to open them, then I have the option to like look at my clock or not or something. Um, so it's just like a, a sort of like a choose your own adventure with just splitting paths the whole way. Mm. Maybe it's slightly more accurate to say that your like subconscious mind is only showing your conscious mind these kind of like binary decisions, but your conscious mind is not like choosing which ones to consider most of the time. Yeah. And so we don't like the subconscious is kind of like a black box. It's like, in some sense, it's doing a lot of processing to decide where the decision points are, right? Yeah. Then we might be interested in like, well, how is that black box considering? Because it's, it's not considering everything either, probably. Then it's interesting to ask like what it's considering and also like how it decides what to spit out. Right. It, yeah. It's certainly not considering everything and it's using some kind of heuristic algorithm itself. It's just that it's much harder to inspect on that algorithm. We, because we don't have conscious access to it. Yeah, so we might be able to notice things about it from the outside. Like, for instance, if things are visibly salient to me, it seems more likely that I'll end up considering a decision involving them. If there are Coca-Cola ads often in my vicinity, maybe I'll more often consider the choice, should I drink Coca-Cola now or not? Whereas if I just didn't see that, maybe I wouldn't make that choice. Right, right. A lot of research has sort of goes into noticing what the subconscious mind decides, right? So like in, in user interface design, you learn things about how to draw attention. So maybe there's 10 buttons on the page, but you can draw attention to one button so that the choice for the user becomes, do I push that button? Not do I look at the other, you know, what do I do about the nine other buttons? Or, um, you know, we know things about like, well, if there was a sudden loud noise, almost certainly you would look at that and that would become the center of your focus. And so then your decision might be like, do I investigate that loud noise? Because we know certain things will cause your subconscious to prioritize that. Yeah. It seems like all this kind of thinking about this makes more sense on this model of a bounded creature where they're only considering a small number of options. 
So that seems like a sort of nice thing about that model. I guess research into advertising maybe makes less sense in the classic utilitarian world of super creatures. Right. Well, ads in that world would just provide you information that you didn't already know. Yeah. Because, you know, even in that world, you still have limits to what you know in any given moment. And so they're like, oh, here's a fact that you didn't yet heard or something. Right. Right. But that's clearly not how most advertisements work. Like, yes, some of them contain facts, but they also contain a lot of other things like someone looking really satisfied or someone drinking the, the beer with very beautiful people around or whatever. Or the implication that this is what everyone else is doing. So you might feel uh, bad not going along with it. Yeah, exactly. So this view of life as a kind of a choose your own adventure story where all you get to choose is like whether to do X or Y in these series of of binary choices. How does this influence your thinking or what what should we draw from this? I think one important way it would change how you behave is then it becomes very important which options do come up, like what the salient choices are that get presented to you. And so you probably shouldn't just leave it to you know, advertising agencies or other people who are trying to make you think about certain things. Um, like if you can see ways to change your own future options, that's going to be very powerful. Yeah, that's super interesting. Like one way to think about it is, you know, advertising companies are trying to put on your like limited set of choices for the day, the choice whether you drink Coca-Cola, right? And, you know, social media sites are trying to put on your list of your limited list of choices for the day do I check Facebook? And maybe now they've replaced like 50 of your choices throughout the day with like, do I check, uh, do I check <laughs> Facebook? Because that's like so salient to your mind and you kind of have this like addictive impulse to check it or that kind of thing. Right. Whereas you might think that if you put other things saliently where you can see them or something, like if you have a book that you want to read sometime, if you put it in a place where you will see it, perhaps that choice will arise sometimes, which might not be enough to get you to actually do it, but it makes it much more likely than if, if you just never thought of it. Yeah, this seems to fall under a class of, of behavior change strategies that I use a lot of myself, where I basically model my future self as a different person than me. Mm. Um, I, I actually feel very identified with my future self and, and my past self. But when I'm thinking about behavior change, I'll temporarily adopt a sense of like, I'm trying to model some uh, someone just like myself and what they would do. And I'm trying to set things up now so that this person just like me will behave the way that I think is best. And there's a lot of tricks I do around that. And sometimes they're around like, oh, leave a note to myself to make sure or like set an alarm that will go off at just (laughs) the right moment so that I'll like that will sort of redirect my attention to a certain choice right that at the time. Or sometimes it's like build a habit so that when this happens, I automatically think to do the next thing without having to, you know, remember. Yeah, I think those seem to fit into this framework. And I guess the thing they're replacing, like the thing that you would do if you were thinking of your future self as the same as you in the usual way would be like changing your future behavior by just like intending for it to be different or committing to it being different. And maybe that that would be more effective if you were a sort of less bounded creature and could just like remember at all times all previous things that you intended or thought about. But if you were unbounded, I'm not sure you would ever need to intend anything. You just, in the future, you're just <laughs> going to calculate all possibilities anyway, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. It's an interesting question why intending to do something ever changes anything. Yeah. You know, but it does, it does seem like it can. It doesn't always, but it seems like if you don't intend to do something, you probably won't do it. But if you intend to do it, you might do it, right? So it's like a first step towards actually doing something. Yeah. But I guess in these cases where you, for instance, leave a note to yourself, you do intend to do the thing, but you also like set up the physical environment to remind you of your intention again, instead of just intending it. Right. And also trying to form a model of why I might not do the thing, right? Because if I thought the reason I wouldn't do the thing is like a lack of motivation, then giving myself a note is probably not going to help unless that note contains on it something that motivates me, right? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Which maybe I could do. But if I think, oh, I'm probably just going to not think of it at that moment. And if I had thought of it, I would have done it. Then just all I need is a reminder, so maybe you know a note or alarm on my phone. So w- once you kind of have a theory of why you're not going to do the thing, then you can try to d- construct an intervention to make that choice salient in the way it needs to be so that you actually do it. Yeah. I guess a, a reason I often don't like having alarms and notifications and things is that feel feels sort of overwhelming or I start to ignore them. And I think maybe that also makes some sense on this model where it's like, well, you have a certain number of choice points or something. And if you try to cause your future behavior by like slotting it into a lot of your choice points, then you might feel like you don't have enough spare slots for whatever else is going on. 
And so it would be nice if you could somehow cause it to happen more automatically so that it wasn't a choice always. Right. Like if you made it into a habit, maybe it would actually take less willpower or um, or create yeah. less, less sort of mental friction to do it. Yeah. This is actually why one of my favorite types of interventions is, okay, so you want yourself to do something. Is there a version of it that's fun? <laughs> because <laughs> if there is, just try that one instead. Like, you know, people will be like, oh man, I hate like running on the treadmill, but I know I should do it. I'm like, okay, well, do you like soccer? Do you like bouldering? <laughs> do you like martial arts? Because if you do, if you, there's any other exercise you like, just do that one instead, you know? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I think the, the bounded person idea is really interesting because it, it shows why heuristics can be so powerful. But, you know, because we're not perfectly rational agents, we have to operate on heuristics. We have no choice. And then that suggests, well, maybe we could learn useful heuristics that, like, even though they're far from optimal, you know, given our limited willpower and bandwidth and working memory and so on, they actually are pretty good to stick by. And um, I also think about principles. This is something we've been delving into lately because we're building a clear thinking module on principles. And I like to define principles as sort of pre-decisions. Like you've decided in advance what you're going to do before a situation has arisen. So for example, you might have a principle of like, always tell the truth with the people you care about, right? And then when you're in a scenario later and you're like, do I tell the truth? You just have to ask, well, is this a person I care about? And you immediately know the answer. And so you're you're kind of pre-deciding. And then you could say, well, why bother pre-deciding anything? Why not just every single situation just decide in the moment? Well, maybe in the moment you're going to be tempted to do the wrong thing or you're going to be exhausted or, you know, it's too cognitively demanding. And so you kind of by pre-deciding based on these principles that that like most of the time lead to good outcomes, you actually maybe can get better outcomes overall. Also, maybe it feels less cognitively demanding and like maybe opens up more like choice points for for other decisions. Yeah. Well, it seems like if the considerations are kind of similar in each of the, the cases that you save a lot of effort in the long run by just doing a calculation once or something. Right. And, and I think there's some other potential benefits of having principles. Like maybe if you have a principle of doing anything, you build an identity around it. So as long as it's a good principle, it's helpful. You build an identity around it and then it like becomes a habit to start doing it. And then maybe you like become more like the sort of person that just always behaves that way. Right. Like like there's something really powerful about not just like being a person that intends to always be honest, but just being a person that like is honest by default. Right. Like and then other people are like, wow, this person's really honest. I can trust them when they tell me something. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, it seems like being transparent to other people is is a sort of general upside of having principles. Right. And you can even, uh, if you make them explicit, you can even like talk about them. And so you can like signal both with your behaviors and with your words at the same time and kind of really show people what sort of person you are. Yeah. If I think of myself as a bounded person, um, a different way that I, I sort of think of my decision making differently is I think people often take for granted that you should have like plans for the future. Like they're sort of like, yeah, what, what are you doing in the next five years or something? What will you be doing in five years? And that seems like the kind of thing that makes more sense if you're unbounded, like if you're, if you're playing chess and, and you could just imagine the entire game tree ahead of you and how to win, it would make sense to be like, you know, in 50 moves, I'm hoping to have the board in this setup. Well, it assumes, assumes both unboundedness and sort of deterministicness, right? Yeah. Because imagine you're playing poker and you're like a perfectly rational <laughs> agent where like, you're like, well, it depends on what my opponent does, right? Like, I can't tell you what I'm going to do, right? Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah, also comes up in real life. But it seems like in chess, the, the thing you do then is, well, I, I'm not a good chess player at all, but my understanding is the thing you do is have an idea of which board positions are good. And, and so you don't think for that many turns, but you have a good sense that like, if you did these next few moves you would get into this better, heuristically better position. And so I sort of wonder whether you should do that in life much more than people often seem to think. So what would that look like? Instead of saying, I hope to be in this particular job or role or something and be married or something in, in five years, you would say, I have no idea what I'll be doing in five years, but I generally have a sense of like which kinds of situations are better like if you gave me a couple of different projects, I could tell you which one I like more. And I'm, I'm going to sort of move in the direction of things that seem good. I guess like a, if you went extremely in this direction, you might just sort of every day do what seems good <laughs> without a particular goal for where that will lead in any period of time. It seems to me that both extremes are not ideal. Like choosing a long term, very specific goal, like, you know, I'm going to get exactly this position can be really a problem because, well, maybe life circumstances make that impossible, or maybe you're going to like over-focus on th getting that exact thing and lose sight of like the reasons you want that thing, because there might be other opportunities to get the, the value that you're seeking that's underneath that 
particular goal. And so you're going to like miss these other opportunities or better ways to get that value, right? You're kind of over-focused. On the other hand, if every day you're just saying like, do what seems good right now, it feels like it's very hard to get to very long-term ambitious achievements because they often require sort of just pushing really hard in one direction and overcoming obstacle after obstacle for a long time. Yeah, I think that seems right. So yeah, my guess is that the, the right thing to do is somewhere in between, as I think also is for many kinds of activities. Like in, in chess, you do still think like, well, well, if I make this move, they'll make that move and then I'll make this move or something somewhat. But you, I think you make a really interesting point that the same way that a chess player doesn't evaluate you know, every single move in the future, but evaluates you know, maybe a few moves in the future but is able to, for any board position, real or imagined, be able to immediately say how, you know, roughly how good that board position is. If we build up better heuristics of like, roughly how good is the situation, then that seems really powerful when we're making decisions because we can say, ah, well, if I were to do this, that would put me in the, this the, a given situation and I can tell how good that is. And if I did this other thing, it would put me in this other situation. So it's like, it's a very powerful kind of hack for not having to kind of iterate through all these future branches of a decision tree, which is impossible. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I, I sometimes think about what it would be like to to just have a much better sense of how valuable different things are. Like you, you could just practice a lot, say, like sort of you make a kind of automated would you rather game that just keeps offering you options. Uh, and then it could maybe tell you like where you're inconsistent. You could like practice and become good at evaluating things consistently and in a way that you approved of. Right. I guess the challenge is you don't know how good they actually turn out to be, right? You maybe can detect inconsistencies, but not like whether they're good choices. All right. I feel like I would still do better than I probably do just making choices in general, because my untrained judgments are probably at least that bad at the thing actually being good in the long term, but also have inconsistencies or like if I made a bunch of similar choices, I would realize at some point that I didn't really like this in a way that was uh, foreseeable. Maybe the way that a chess master might use certain signs of progress in the game, we can use certain signs that like we're getting to better and better places. Like, for example, they might have a notion, I'm not, you know, a chess player, but they might have a notion of like how much control of the board they have or, well, obviously, you know, how many pieces they have versus the other player or, you know, how like sort of locked up the other player's pieces are or something like this, right? And, um, you know, we might, might be able to use heuristics like, well, how much like freedom do I have in my life? Or, or, you know, how many resources do I have? Or how happy am I? Or maybe like, how much do I know about the things I want to know about? Or, you know, like these different sort of heuristics that like we're moving in the right direction, even if we're like, don't know where we're trying to get to. Yeah. It seems like there are so many different ones that it's like harder to have a high level picture than it is in chess, I assume. Right. It's interesting to think about like every month doing a rating on different dimensions of like how your life is going and you know, yeah. see if you're, you're actually making progress or not. Maybe there's something to that. Are you facing a tough or important life decision? Then you should try using Clearer Thinking's Decision Advisor tool to make it easier. With this tool, you won't have to stress as much about those big life decisions. The Decision Advisor can walk you through even the most complicated situations in minutes, so you can come out on the other side with a better idea of what to do. To use the free Decision Advisor tool or to find Clearer Thinking's other free tools and mini courses, head to clearerthinking.org. So one issue that this kind of thinking brings up is this distinction between quantitative methods or like ways of providing like sort of numerical values to things or thinking in terms of like the efficiency where you can take some number and optimize it versus these more kind of qualitative ways of evaluating things and saying how good they are. Um, I know you have some thoughts about this. Uh, Want to share? Yeah. I guess one thing that, that I've thought about is uh, it seems like people often don't like the, the quantitative ones as much or sort of feel like they're kind of cold or likely to be bad somehow. Uh, I, I think that's interesting in that, like, especially the, the word efficiency I've thought about. Uh, it seems like people kind of associate it with like coldness and maybe like missing out on things that you care about, which is interesting because it kind of just means like getting the thing you're trying to get as well as possible, which seems like it should be good. Right. It reminds me of this quote that sometimes is attributed to Einstein, although I don't know if Einstein ever said it, which is that 
everything that can be counted does not necessarily count. Everything that counts can't necessarily be counted. So I wonder if that's part of where people come from on this, that they think like, well, if you're talking about efficiency, you're talking about the things that you can like easily measure and the things you can easily measure are probably not the things that like really matter. Yeah, I think that's my best guess about what is going on, that like whenever in practice people are trying to do well on some sort of metric, they're using like a metric rather than just like a vague sense of what is good. <laughs> and then the metric is missing things out and then people are unhappy about that. It seems like this suggests that, like you might think that if you try and do well in a metric, you would at least get more of the things you were, you did include in the metric, maybe at the expense of the other things. And you might hope that that was overall good, uh, you know, or we wouldn't keep doing this. <laughs> we do it quite a lot. But the, the fact that people sort of seem to feel unhappy about it suggests that it might be net bad. It seems like it depends on how mu- how ruthlessly you optimize for a metric. Like I tend to think if you pick pretty much any metric and like kind of mo- optimize it really intensely, you know, you're saying I'm willing to, I do, all, my only goal is just to squeeze out more on this metric. I don't care about anything else. And I'm going to push really hard in that direction. It tends to produce really bad things because it, there's like almost no metric that really encapsulates what we care about. But if you're just saying, oh, nudge it a bit in that direction, like take, you know, one gradient step, usually that's fairly safe because you're kind of like keeping in mind that you don't actually care about it infinitely. And like, you know, it's not necessarily the case that after this one gradient step, you're, that's going to be your highest priority anymore to go further in that direction. Yeah, that's interesting. And then I guess the times that people are like, this thing is really efficient. That's especially when they've gone really hard on the metrics. So that you can see that the numbers are looking very good. And so then those tend to be the worst circumstances. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to imagine a society where they're like, okay, actually, the only thing we care about is GDP per capita. That's it, right? And then like immediately you're like, okay, what would that involve? Like kicking out poor people? <laughs> like, you know, like, because that will make GDP per capita go up, right? But that's clearly not what we want. So, you know, it's just like, you know, try to, you know, just try to pick a metric where like it doesn't immediately lead to perverse strategies. You know, it's actually surprisingly difficult. Yeah. And I guess I'm not sure what to do about this in that um, optimize less, less ruthlessly seems potentially good, but it's kind of hard to specify what that is. Maybe I'm just assuming that one has to specify things and optimize them ruthlessly. One approach that I like to take is try to have multiple metrics. Like this comes up in software products where you're like, okay, you know, what do we really care about? And people sometimes talk about, you know, your key performance indicator. And it's like, well, because no single metric is actually what you care about. I like to think about it as you have a bunch of metrics, each of which is a flawed indicator, but it, but it's sort of related in some way to what you actually care about. And so you're kind of tracking a whole bunch of these different indicators that you're following as kind of a swarm of indicators, trying to move them in the kind of the right direction. And, and you often alternate between them. You're like, okay, for this month, we're going to focus on, you know, conversion rate. And for this month, we're going to focus on retention rate. So, you know, it's too hard to keep them all in mind every second, but you kind of are looking at them all and, you know, you're, you're taking turns kind of optimizing on each of them while watching how the other ones move. And then reminding yourself that none of them are actually the real thing. The real thing you care about is something else that can only be described in words. And even then it may be difficult to describe in words, but it certainly can't be described as a single number. So you're kind of like trying to notice if the swarm of indicators is doing well, but somehow you're drifting from like the actual thing you care about, in which case you maybe need to add more indicators to get closer to the thing you care about. Mm. Is this different from just having like a very complicated indicator? Well, I think it depends what you mean. Like if a, if an indicator is just a single number, it's sort of very, very hard to use a single number and encapsulate enough stuff. But like if your goal, let's say that your goal with a product is to like improve people's lives as much as possible, right? So one indicator might be like how many people use our product. And another indicator might be like, once they start using our product, how long do they stick with it? And another indicator might be about when they do stick with our product, how much value do we think they get out of it? But that's not, that's not enough because like maybe it also has to be a sustainable business. And so you need other indicators that are like about your profitability, right? Uh, and, And so on. Yeah, I guess I was imagining, well, maybe you could just have one number that was kind of like, how many people use your product multiplied by some number, plus how how sustainable is it in whatever way you measure that times another number, etc. I think it's very tough. <laughs> I, I sort of do imagine that going badly. Yeah, I think it I think it's it can be very misleading because once you have that big number, you kind of then in order to like reason about it, you have to pull it apart again, like to actually understand what's going on. And then like, why not just look at the whole swarm of indicators? Like, Yes, maybe it may be adding the com- combination of them as yet another indicator is useful, right? But still, like, I would want to look at all the different pieces of that and see what's going on. It also gets especially hard when you get things like, oh, wait, I also need my team to be happy. 
well, how do you combine team happiness into this met metric that also includes profitability and user retention and, you know, marketing? And it's like, it gets, it's, it seems incredibly hard to like combine that into one number. Or at least like a number that does actually track what you value. Right, right. And what you value is just like this thing in your mind that is very, very complex. And, uh, you know, it's none of the metrics really map onto it. They're just correlated. I guess an interesting thing to me then is like, how do you manage to pursue that when, like, if you're not having various metrics and you're, you're not sort of trying to be efficient or something, are you just pursuing that unspoken <laughs> set of things relatively well? Or like, why, why does that do better in some sense? Or why do people like that? Well, you know, I think it's a good question. And I think in the general consensus in like the startup world is that like having metrics actually is really important. If you don't have them, you just kind of like do a bunch of stuff and you don't tend to make a lot of progress. I mean, obviously there's exceptions. Some people do really well. They're using some kind of internal metric. But like, uh, I think it's generally believed that having external metrics actually helps people do a better job. And it, it makes it harder to bullshit yourself, right? Because you see something is changing. So th I think there is a lot of value in these metrics as imperfect as they are. But uh, to your point, you know, we, I think it's worth wondering, like the distaste people have for quote efficiency or the distaste people have for quantifying things, like, is there some wisdom in that? And are they, you know, should we take that seriously that so many people seem turned off by that? I guess I would like to, to try to take it seriously, um, but I'm not sure where to go with that. <laughs> well, what sort of context do you think people tend to bring this up the most in? I mean, I, I sometimes see it in context of like doing good, right? Like the quantifying doing good loses something important. Or maybe government policy, trying to quantify it too much? Yeah. I think if you try to quantify things in your own life also, uh, <laughs> that might bring it up, especially if it's, I don't know. I guess there are places where I don't see it brought up that much, but where I sort of imagine that it would get brought up if, if people were quantifying the things, which is perhaps a different sort of data point. Like if you, if you tried to kind of quantify your spending time with your children or something and tried to just like hit some some markers of successfully being with them or something. Right. Well, I think that if people quantify like how much they sleep, that's maybe considered slightly weird. But if people quantify like how much quality time they spend with their children, people think that's very weird. And maybe what's going on there is this idea of like sacred goods versus quantification. Like spending time with your children is like sacred in some sense. It's like sort of deeply meaningful and when you're in the mindset of quantification, it's sort of like the wrong mindset to do a sort of sacred activity. Yeah, that seems right. That seems kind of interesting. Like quantifying how much you like all your friends. That seems distasteful <laughs> oh, to yeah. a lot of people, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know? Or like quantifying how good different people are on some metric um, is a thing that I've sometimes seen people do, and it does seem distasteful <laughs> to, to, to many Right. So then are there good reasons to find it distasteful? Like we, so a lot of people seem to have a, a natural kind of negative reaction to it. But, um, you know, what are, what are they pointing at? Like, what's the, you know, is there value in that? I guess there it's, it's maybe not to do with the quantification so much as just actually the containing spicy information. <laughs> like, if, especially if you share the information with the relevant people. Right. If you like rank everyone on, like, uh, I think if I recall correctly, Mark Zuckerberg, before starting Facebook, made a website where people would rate the attractiveness of like a college freshman or something like this, which was, yeah, you know, right. seemed like really, seems really bad thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Maybe part of what's going on is that we want to be around people that aren't doing a calculation when they interact with us. So imagine that a, a friend invites you out to get coffee and then they offer to pay. And then you realize that they like wrote down in a ledger, like how much they spent on you. Right. And then they like expect you later to like pay exactly the same amount. We would be like, oh, that's not really the kind of interaction we want because we want them to like offer to pay just because like they want us to be happy. And then later we'll offer to pay because we want them to be happy, not feeling like we're creating a ledger. Like it's not a tit for tat relationship. It's a, we like each other. We value each other relationship. If that makes sense. Yeah. And I guess that that also makes me think like, just in general, if someone is calculating things, it suggests that they're be, like potentially being more kind of Machiavellian and maybe treating you as an, you know, a means rather than an end or something. Whereas if they're not calculating and using their intuitions, it's sort of more likely that they're being driven by like their gut feelings or something. So to the extent that you hope that they like really like you or something or are 
moved by the sacredness of a thing or something, if you sort of expect that to to go more through their intuitions, then calculating things is evidence that they're not doing that. Right. Like imagine you could spend time with two different people. And in the past, they both treated you exactly the same. But one treated you well because they like like you and care about you. And the other treated you well because they were analyzing this is sort of like tit for tat relationship. And they realized that by treating you well, that would lead to like the best outcome. <laughs> you know, it feels like we'd, we'd much rather hang out with the first person, you know, like, <laughs> even if their behavior so far has been the same. Yeah, that's interesting. Like maybe we prefer to hang out with virtue ethicists deep down rather than like <laughs> utilitarians deep down or something like this. What do you think about that? Uh, I think. In that particular scenario, I do imagine feeling more wary of the uh, the calculating person, which is sort of interesting in that the calculating person is more predictable in some sense. <laughs> it, it sort of seems like they are in that, like, well, if I continue to cooperate with them in this way, presumably they will continue to protect nicely, whereas the other person... Right, like you can apply <laughs> game theory to them, right? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, apparently that makes me feel more wary. Well, one thing I find kind of funny, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but it seems to me that a lot of um, effective altruists who are very steeped in kind of utilitarian philosophy, they actually behave very virtue ethics in person, uh, which I like because I think like in my moment to moment interactions with someone, like I don't want them doing a calculus about like, is this conversation the maximally good thing for the world? <laughs> you know, like that feels very distracting to me. Uh, I want them to like hang out with me because like, uh, like, or, or honesty is a really good example. I want them to be honest with me because they're honest as a person, not because they like did a calculation and decided that not lying to me on this instance was better than lying to me. Yeah. It seems like you can sort of separate these behaviors into like calculatingness and like goal directedness or something where you could imagine a person being utilitarian in the sense that they're trying to do the thing that is like most good in some sense or, or like most consequentially good. But the way they're getting the answer about what is good is by consulting their sense of what will go well rather than calculating. And I think that makes me feel better. I wonder how you feel about that. Right. Well, it's interesting. Imagine someone who like they really like you and they really want to have a good friendship. And so they quantify like how every you know, after each interaction with you, they go home and they like put in a spreadsheet quantifying how it went and then like try to think about, OK, how can I make it go better next time? I kind of thought that like quirky but like endearing in a way <laughs> like maybe it's a little obsessive but like it's like oh they like care so much and like they're just trying to bring their nerdy quantification to the process of like having a better relationship whereas if it feels like someone's has some ulterior motive or like whether or not they're quantifying it like oh they're spending time with me in order to achieve xyz goal that has nothing to do with me then i think it feels bad either way whether there's quantification involved or not yeah right as in like if they just think that broadly the future will go better if they hang out with you and they haven't thought about why or anything, that still feels kind of more alarming. Right. So maybe it's just that in many cases, quantification is a signal for this calculatingness. Right. In theory, they're not the same thing. But like often when you're calculating numerically, you're being calculating, you know, strategically, if that makes sense. Yeah. So in the case where, where your friend goes home and calculates about like, you know, how to be friends with you, it's also strategic. It's just strategic where they do care about you. Right, right. I mean, strategic, like for some ulterior event, right? Like, yeah. What if they do care about you, uh, and they also think that it's good to care about you for some future event? I mean, I think that's okay as long as it, it sort of depends on the amount, right? Like, yeah. If it's like ninety percent, they're hoping this good thing will happen for them in the future because we hang out, and ten percent, it's like they just like being with me. Then I think that's not great. But it feels totally fine to like have you know at least a little bit of a reason you like someone to be some other thing, but. If it becomes too big, then that's a problem. What do you think? I guess I feel like there's a different sort of thing where it's like people are like, well, it's somehow good to like for me to just deeply care about people. Um, I think that my life will go better and the world will go better if I just have some people I really care about. And then they go ahead and really care about some people where it somehow is doing fine on the utilitarian calculus and also involves kind of genuinely caring about the person. It's possible this doesn't actually make sense in the end somehow, but I think it's a sort of appealing way of combining the things. It seems also that when we want someone to like us, like we want them to like us for certain reasons, like we actually care about why they like us. And if like their reason is just like they wanted to care about someone and we happen to be standing there, it feels like they don't care about us in the same way. They just like care about a person that just happens to be us. 
yeah, that seems right. Though I, I could imagine, like, seems like you could have a similar thing where it's like, well, they wanted to care about, or they prefer to care about someone for like various reasons that, that made the person seem good, and you you were standing there with with those good characteristics that they liked. Would that be objectionable? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, if you break down, why does someone like us, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> this story is going to become objectionable. Right, I mean, at the end of the day, there's always like a series of reasons, probably not mostly conscious ones, probably many of them subconscious, but like, you know, they like the way we talk and, you know, they like the way we smile and they, you know, think that we say interesting things or, you know, they like the way that we ask about them. And, you know, like, I mean, if you actually break it down, it ends up just being right. a series of things. So this, this sort of gets in the issue of explicitness. There's something about being too explicit about it that seems to kind of break the spell. Right. Like hmm. if subconsciously if someone processes all the stuff about you and they really like you, it feels better than if they're like, oh, well, there's three reasons I like you. And one of them is like the way that you ask me questions. And another one of the reasons is that, like, I like the way you look. And, you know, then it feels like very weird and awkward, yeah. even though maybe that's like what their subconscious is doing anyway. Yeah. If they had a long enough list, would it become less awkward? It does feel less awkward if it's like a long <laughs> enough list. And then it feels yeah. more like they like me and not just like some random aspect of me. Right. I guess it probably feels better. It's just like they like you in spite of any of your characteristics. They're, they know that runs into other problems. As in, if they're just like, yeah, I like you, it would be fine if you, you know, became terrible at asking me questions and were really ugly and stuff. I'd still like you. Well, then that starts to border on a feeling of like an attachment that like has nothing to do with you. If it, if it really, if it becomes independent of all your characteristics, then it's like, what is it? Is it, is it even about you? And I mean, that actually seems like the way parents are often bond to their children, but not, not always, obviously, but like they often seem to have this bond that like no matter how bad their kid is, like they still have this like really strong attachment to the child. Right. I guess it seems hard to have a good answer here for how to relate to other people. I mean, for one thing, it seems like if you were going to like people in explicit conflict with what is good in the future, like <laughs> if it was like, yes, being friends with this person is going to make the world worse long run <laughs> and destroy value. Like that seems bad. So it's like, if you just not allowed to check whether you think it will be good or bad to be friends with someone, or is it just bad if you're only friends with them because you think it will be good, but it's fine to be friends with them because you want to Except, don't do it if it's not going to be good. I'm not sure if that makes sense. Yeah, I think again, it just depends on how much is influencing you, right? If it's the primary consideration, then that feels bad. Whereas if it's just a minor consideration, that seems fine. I mean, it's maybe interesting to take a step back here and say, what what is the thing we're really talking about? I suspect what we're talking about is that humans evolved a mode for interacting with other humans, and that mode has like certain roles to it, and that if you go too far outside of those rules, you're no longer doing that thing that we like call human bonding or friendship or whatever, or connection. And so like, there's this mode we can be in mentally and then someone can like deviate outside of that. And we're like, ah, I thought we were in that. I thought we were doing that friendship thing. And then we're clearly not because you're not in the right mode. We need to both be in the mode for it to work. And things like being like, well, I'm just friends with that person because I think like it will cause me to have a higher impact or something that like breaks, breaks that mode. So they're not in it. And so then, and we, and it's also a bilateral mode. Like if the other person's, if we think the other person's not in it, we can't be in it. it. Like knocks us out of it. Right. And so being in the mood requires only having certain kinds of thoughts or like avoiding having certain kinds of thoughts. I think that's right. Yeah. In some sense, that seems like quite a big constraint or something. Right. Right. Thoughts that are like, well, I'm just seeing this person for like X, Y, Z benefit or like seem to violate that. And so like, if you're actually having those thoughts, you're kind of broken out of it. Maybe the other person can't detect it. And so that actually maybe gives you reason to suppress thoughts like that, right? And convince yourself that that's not your motivation, even if it is. Or like even just wondering, is it good in consequentialist terms <laughs> that we're hanging out? Right. Well, I think it's fine. I think it's fine to consider that as long as it's not the ju the justification for hanging out, right? Mm, yeah. All right. So before we wrap up, I want to do a rapid fire round where I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions to try to get your... Quick answer on extremely difficult questions. So <laughs> you ready? <laughs> oh dear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So Sleeping Beauty argument. What's the solution to it? Third. One third. Okay. You want to get to say a few sentences about why it's one third? All right. So the setup is you have Sleeping Beauty. She's going to go to sleep. You're going to flip a coin. And if the coin comes up heads, you're going to wake her up on Monday. And if the coin comes up tails, you're going to wake her up on Monday. And then 
give her some sort of drug so that she doesn't remember it and then wake her up on Tuesday. And then I guess in any case, she's going to go back to sleep and then wake up again after the experiment and you're going to tell her the experiment's over. So there are like three different possible wakings that will happen in the experiment. It could be tails and Monday or tails and Tuesday, or it could be heads and Monday. And when she wakes up, the question is what probability she should put on heads. Right. And one side of the argument says, well, the coin has a 50-50 chance of landing on heads, so the probability has got to be 50-50. You know, we, she hasn't learned any new information, so that's what's got to be. And the other side of the argument says something like, well, there are more people waking up in the kind of one-third probability scenario, so it should tilt towards one-third. Is that accurate? Yeah. So we can put a link in the show notes to the Sleeping Beauty argument for those who want to look into that. Do you think that AI will be agentic? Maybe you could take a second to, to say what you think agentic means. Yeah, agentic means roughly goal-directed. So like cares about the world being a certain way and moves toward making it that way or like likes some states of the world more than others versus kind of having patterns of action or patterns of response to things that aren't really paying attention to how the world will go in the future. I do think that at least some AI is likely to be agentic because it just seems very useful. For instance, if you can just have another person that you give a task to and they know what the goal is and they can work on making that goal happen, that's better for you than if you still have to try to direct things toward that goal yourself just using various tools, it, it seems like. So there are a lot of different narratives for, quote, what's going on in the world. What are a couple narratives that you think are particularly helpful right now? I guess a particularly salient one is AI is progressing relatively quickly and might cause great destruction or utopia. And so how anything else affects that is sort of one of the more important things going on with, with everything else. That's a narrative that I sort of spend a lot of time around. Okay, the great filter argument, you want to just say in like a few sentences what that is and whether you think anthropic reasoning implies we're going to get destroyed in the future due to it? Yeah, so the, the great filter argument is sort of, it seems like there are lots of planets in the universe, say. There aren't any alien civilizations that are so advanced and successful that we can see them or, or like, yeah, see evidence of them for instance, because they've actually come here and we've met them or because they've sort of built anything really impressive. That suggests that somewhere on the path between being a random planet and giving rise to a incredibly successful civilization, there are some really hard steps, like super duper hard steps. So I think Robin Hansen named this the great filter, like the, this set of, I guess, like planets are getting filtered out on their way to success. And so this is kind of interesting because then if if we would like to um, you know ultimately survive and go out and conquer the stars or live in the stars um, and, and do things that would be visible, it's interesting to ask like are these really hard steps in our past or in our future? And I think maybe the ones in the past look harder. Like for instance, you know, is how hard is it for life to begin? Is perhaps the popular one for thinking like it might just be very hard. But if you use this kind of anthropic reasoning where uh, you, you think you're probably more likely to find yourself or you sort of up, up weight hypotheses where you're likely to exist instead of not exist. Like you take your existence as evidence that it's like one of the scenarios where there are lots of people like you, then this is like a, a big update in favor of thinking that the filter is in the future because then it's like pretty easy for it to be civilizations at our level of development. But then that's pretty alarming because then it, it means that we haven't hit the step yet that's really hard. There are other complications here that might make this not go through. For instance, I guess Carl Schulman uh, and Mark Zhu have recently written about how the simulation argument might undercut this because maybe you should just think you're in a simulation instead once you're using this kind of reasoning. Interesting. So if I understand you properly, you're saying if we're trying to figure out sort of what the state of the universe is, because we exist, it seems like that should give higher probability to states of the universe that have more like things like us. But then that kind of tilts the balance towards thinking that the grief filter might be in front of us rather than behind us. Is that right? Yeah. But then maybe that kind of reasoning also influences like the chance we're living in simulation because it has a similar kind of thinking to it. Uh, so it kind of complicates matters further. 
yeah, and I haven't thought through whether I agree with that modification. All right, Katya, last question for you. What's something you've changed your mind about? I thought that philosophy was probably not very good. <laughs> so I, I thought I should read a philosophy journal, I guess. And I, I think I actually came across an article about the sleeping beauty problem pretty quickly in that journal. Um, and I was like, ah, obviously it's uh, such and such. And I was like, no, wait, it's actually the other thing. And then I got, I, I became very interested in it and thought about it a lot. And then I, I guess did like a honors thesis on anthropics and the great filter um, with David Chalmers as my supervisor. So, so not officially in the philosophy department, but a uh, pretty philosophy leaning thing. And then I went to grad school in philosophy, uh, though I dropped out again. So you say philosophy is better than you thought? Uh, yeah, <laughs> or at least I, I ultimately considered it worthy of a bunch of my time. Awesome. Katja, thank you so much for coming on. This was really fun. Thank you. Thanks again for listening. We always love to hear from our listeners. So if you have questions or comments for us, just send us an email at clearerthinkingpodcast at gmail.com. This episode was edited by Ryan Kessler and transcribed by Janessa Barill. Uri Bram is the podcast's factotum. To find show notes, transcripts, and more info about the show, visit clearerthinkingpodcast.com. And if you like the show, we'd really appreciate it if you could rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about us on social media. We also hope you'll subscribe to our email newsletter called One Helpful Idea. Each week, we'll send you one idea that we think is really valuable that you can read about in just 30 seconds, along with that week's new podcast episodes, an essay by Spencer, and announcements about upcoming events. You can sign up for that newsletter on our website, clearerthinkingpodcast.com. 